Hello everyone and welcome to Access HE live at Regent High School. My name is Taylor and I'm from Access HE and today I'm going to be hosting this very special one-off event with your school. So today you're going to have the chance to get your questions answered by real life students, by outreach professionals from both the University of Sussex and London Metropolitan University. We're going to be covering all of the basics. So how to apply to university, what subject choices to make, and how to achieve that balance between social and academic life. Plus, you'll also have the chance to learn about basic student finance and also specific support that might be available to you. But before we start, I want to direct you all to the link at the bottom of your screens. So if you could all please take uh, a moment or two minutes to complete this questionnaire that we've set out to get a better impression of who you are. So I'll be back in two minutes to introduce our speakers, but in the meantime, please do complete this simple survey. So go to menti.com and use the code 162633. That's 162633, and I'll be back in two minutes. Okay, everyone, we're back and ready to introduce our two guest speakers for today who have kindly volunteered their time to speak with us. So our first speaker is Mina Sadisvan from the University of Sussex. Mina is a current second year politics student at the university where she went to from Croydon um, and now is going to speak about that process of moving from South London to Brighton and how she chose Sussex and what to study there. Secondly, after that, we have Charlotte Gogan from London Metropolitan University. Charlotte is a senior widening participation officer at the university and is today going to be speaking about the basics of student finance 
and the support that might be available to you. Finally, it's also worth mentioning that throughout this session, you'll have the chance to ask your own questions um, directly to our two speakers. So again, at the bottom of the screen, you'll find a link to menti.com. Please do enter the code 772038 to ask any questions to the presenter. These are completely anonymous and remember there's no silly question. Uh, so if a question isn't being answered throughout the presentation, we will also have time at the end of our session, um, about 15 minutes, where we can have all those questions answered. So without further delay, I'm going to hand over to Mina from the University of Sussex, who is going to take us through her presentation. Um, if she can now just share her screen. Hi, Mina. Hello. Just going to quickly share this. Uh, okay. So hi, everybody. My name is Mina Sadasavan, and I am from the University of Sussex. I am currently a second year politics student, but the year is now. It's now third year because I've done all my exams and everything. So I'm technically enrolled into my third year. Um, but yeah, I, I do study politics. So I'll be talking a little bit about that. But um, the focus what well, I'll try and talk the most about my transition from going from Croydon to an area like Brighton and for many of you that might be daunting the idea of moving from one place to another um, especially if you're not like used to like living somewhere else so yeah um, I will go into the next slide and this is the content that I'll be covering so I'll be talking about um, my university decisions and like what sort of led me to want to study politics and sort of the things I did to sort of help me get there. Um, then I'll talk a bit about Freshers Week um, and then sort of delve into some of the activities and stuff you can do. Um, I'll also go and break down what my day-to-day -day routine is like when I'm at university and what my overall learning looks like. Uh, a bit more about what living at university is like in terms of living on campus or off campus. I will talk a little bit more on the on-campus side of things. Um, also some work and volunteering opportunities, which is um, something many students here at the university do, including myself. So I'll talk mostly about my own experiences of doing that. Um, second and third year studies um, in terms of like how you can make your um, degree quite flexible and cater to what you want, uh, which is often a misconception. And people just think that you just do the whole three years and you don't really like you can't really make it flexible to yourself. Um, a little bit about graduation and then what my final steps are um, and any questions. So as already mentioned, go on the uh, Mentee website and type in the code 772038 where you can ask me any questions that I might miss out. So yeah, I really hope you guys are able to make the most of this session and I'm really excited to sort of talk you through what my journey has been. So my university decisions. Um, as I've already mentioned, I'm from Croydon. So I went to a school in Croydon called the Archbishop Lanfranc, which is now Archbishop Lanfranc Academy, which was um, in Mitcham, but kind of not. It's like it's like more in the Croydon area of it. So I was there um, until I was in year 11. Um, my school was a comprehensive state school at the time and we didn't have a sick form. So we I had to basically move. And so I went to Wallingham sick form, which was more outside of Croydon, um, it was more like in Surrey. So it was a completely different experience to what I'm used to. Um, and I think that was one of my first steps to being sort of in a different environment, um, which definitely helped me when I got to university. Um, the subjects I studied was AS biology, maths, history and politics. And I always sort of knew I had an interest in politics, um, but you know, family and stuff like that, they weren't always so excited about me studying politics. They didn't really see the value in it, but I'm a firm believer that when you go to university, you should study your passion. Um, and that's the best way to succeed because you're gonna enjoy what you're doing. Um, and so I decided to go for with politics and doing it at A-level definitely sort of helped that. At the same time, I do want to reiterate that it is completely okay to not know what you want to study. It is completely normal. Many people don't know, um, and that's completely fine. Um, but for me, I sort of was able to navigate what I really wanted to study um, when I was in sixth form. 
And so I went ahead with that. Um, the reason I wanted to study politics specifically at Sussex is because I've always had more of an interest in international politics and sort of studying other peoples, other other peoples, other countries, um, political systems, which is very different to European politics. Um, I just always had a bit of an interest in that. And Sussex offers more of an international sort of um, modules and um, stuff like that curriculum. So. They do things like Germany, China, India, various, various countries. So um, particularly because I am of Indian heritage, heritage, so I thought it would be nice to learn a bit more about India. Um, and something I did to sort of facilitate um, me getting to university is I attended taster sessions, uh, which was basically where universities would hold free sessions for um, students that were currently doing the A-levels or GCSEs, it, it doesn't really matter, to come and sit in one of their lectures that they would host specifically, specifically for students to sort of learn more about their subject area. Um, so I attended that at LSE and I also did summer schools at Warwick and UCL. Um, with that all being something I did to help facilitate me getting into university, unfortunately, just like many students, it doesn't always go exactly how it how it planned how I initially planned it. Um, so, because I missed one grade, I had to I could do a foundation year. Um, so that's what I did. I did a foundation year in social sciences. And um, for those of you that don't really know what a foundation year is, it's basically a bridging between a levels and university and you have like one year to sort of um delve into your subject area but it's a, a bit more relaxed it's not so intense whereas with first year you go straight on to second year whereas with your foundation year you can take a bit more time to um learn all the skills necessary for university and for me because I did social sciences I could learn all sorts of subjects that I never even learned at when I was at school. So that meant like international development, um, international relations, anthropology, just so many really interesting topics. So yeah, I really enjoyed doing foundation year before I started doing my politics degree. So that's a bit about my university decisions. Um, one of the major things about coming to universities and you'll really stand out when you first come is societies and sports clubs. We have a variety of all kinds of societies and sports clubs here at Sussex and across universities in, across the UK. Um, so some of the things that you can do um, might be more specific to your subject area. So I study politics and we do have a politics society. If you do chemistry, there's a chemistry society. So it's a nice way to meet your course mates if that's something you really want to do. And um, you can also maybe pick up a new skill, which many people also do. So you might want to learn to knit or something like that. There's so many societies that sort of teach you those sorts of skills. There's Zumba, which is um, a former ambassador set up and that's really popular at the University of Sussex. Um, or you can do sports like rugby, you can do football, you can do American football, you can do lacrosse. Um, so there's so many, so many things you can take part in when you're at university. It doesn't necessarily need to just be full study um there are other like random ones like quidditch society harry potter harry, harry potter society board games uh doctor who so there's all, loads and loads of fun little things you can do whilst you're studying so freshers week freshers week is i will say my experience was a, a week full of emotions because it's my first time moving away from home and coming from london which was so different and so vibrant and it was just kind of like its own little bubble to move to Brighton. It was definitely scary in the beginning, but I felt like Freshers Week helps helps you to sort of um, calm your nerves, calm your nerves a little bit, and um, sort of find some new friends and sign up to new activities, try something new. Um, above all else, uh, whilst you can have a good time and all that, it's a good way. It's a good way for you to familiarise yourself with campus and familiar familiarise yourself with university life, um, which was definitely something I found really useful. Because once course start, all the course stuff starts and things, it can get really um, hectic, and you just kind of want one week to just learn a bit more about what university is beyond your course so there are so many things you can do um you can go to meet and greets um it's just a great way for you to make friends as well um everybody's in the same boat and i'll probably repeat this again because i don't feel like it is, it is generally like everybody is going through the same thing so it's not something you should be so worried about but 
yeah, just keep that in mind. So Freshers' Week is a great time for you to just learn um, all sorts of things and join new things as well. So my learning. Um, so because I do politics, it's not going to be as packed out as a subject like maybe engineering or um, medicine or pharmacy. Literally, I have eight contact hours a week. So that means I only have to spend eight hours formally sitting in a classroom or a lecture theatre. Um, and that's because for my subject, it is very much independent learning. I mostly um, just spend my time learning on my own, um, maybe talking to other students about how we can formulate an argument um, in preparation for our classes. So what does our classes look like? For me, I have four lectures. Um, and for those of you that don't know what a lecture is, it's basically like, it kind of looks like a, uh, like a cinema. It's like, it's got the whole elevated seating thing. And then you have one professor or a PhD student or somebody that specializes in that particular subject talking at students. Um, you don't really have much interaction. You might do, um, I never really did. Most of mine don't. Um, and then you have seminars. And seminars are more like formal classrooms and you just have a teacher, teacher. Um, it's mostly like a PhD student or it might be a lecturer, it kind of depends. And you just sort of sit in a classroom and you discuss the readings, you discuss the lecture and you just have an overall discussion. So that's what, that, what, that's what um, I am usually preparing for. Um, and it's mostly like essays and coursework and things like that. So it doesn't really require me to be in a classroom all the time, but um, as I've mentioned, it does vary subject to subject. So the way um, exams work is a bit different. It might be like how you might have it at school where you might have mock exams like in December, January, and then you have your real ones um, in the summer. Whereas for us, um, we have two exam blocks. So one in December slash January, and then one in June slash July. And basically, for me, because of the, how my course is set out, I have mostly essays. So this year, particularly, I had exams in January and February, but I did not have any exams in June or July. I just had pure coursework. So um, if you do something like engineering or medicine or something completely, something else, basically, um, you might have it completely different, but it sort of depends on what your course is and I definitely think that's something very important to look into when you are considering university because for some people that might they might perform better at exams and other people might perform better at coursework like myself so you can vary your course to tailor to your needs basically. Um, options for a year abroad and a placement so those are very popular so you can do a year abroad um, probably between your second and third year where you spend a year in like a different country you can go to Japan you can go to America you can go to Amsterdam there's so many so many places you can go ahead and learn in um, or you can do a placement which is a professional placement where you might work for a company for a year it's a good way for you to gain experience and basically learn something completely new um, and pick up those skills which will benefit you once you graduate so that's a little bit about my learning so um what is it like when I first arrived um so I think this is generally a very important thing to discuss because many of you are probably are probably most familiar with staying in one place with your families your guardians whoever whoever's taking care of you um so for me, it was definitely in the beginning very daunting because I've never lived on my own. I thought, what am I going to do? Like, I can't, I can't do any of this on my own. But really, once you're in that situation, you just sort of, you just get on with it. And because of the way Freshers' Week is set up and the way everybody is so excited, everybody's new. Honestly, like making friends was really quick and easy, and I didn't feel that fear anymore. I pretty much settled in immediately that again does vary person to person but um I definitely think it's more of a good thing to be a little bit scared than be bad than the bad thing because it's a new experience it's a new chapter of your life so um I lived in East Slope which was one of the oldest like one of the most run down um accommodations on campus which doesn't exist anymore but um it was definitely the cheapest on campus, but it was one that had the most, um, it was very sociable and it was really great fun uh, to live with. Um, I lived with six people. Um, we had our own bedrooms and stuff, but we had to share 
our um, kitchens and bathrooms and things. But um, overall, I really think it's been really great living on campus in my first year. And now I actually live out with my friends in my second year and my third year. So in foundation year, I lived on campus, but the following two years I was off campus. Um, but yeah, so Freshers Week is a great way to meet people, as I will reiterate again. And you can go to meet and greets, and that's basically what I did. And I was able to make a lot of friends that way. So working and volunteering. Um, so I I do quite a lot of things, as you can see. Um, again, your degree does come first. If you're able to make your degree flexible to your working, I understand working is a little bit different because you might need to, if um, it comes down to it, and that's basically what happened with me. I just decided I need to pick up a part-time job just to make a bit of extra money. So I started working for WP, which is what I do now, and I really it's probably my favorite job um and it's really nice to just work with younger young people and talk about university which is something I'm very passionate about um but I also did some retail work last year where I worked in a shoe shop and um and just retail in general um but I'm very into activism at the university I think across the board there is a general issue of diversity and representation in education so I do a lot of working work with campaigns and um, societies to sort of facilitate a better working environment for ethnic minority students and sort of ensure that we have the same quality of education for everybody and I started my own podcast which was really cool and that was because of the university with URF which is the radio um, society that we have on campus and I and it's basically where we talk about our experiences as women of colour hence wokeness is basically an abbreviation for that and it's been really fun and it's definitely been very informative and really like nice to just talk, talk, talk with your friends and have people relate to that and most recently um, I've become social media manager for Bain Sussex so as you can see I do a lot of stuff but that's because I'm able to because my my course is not as dense as others may be. So in your second and third year, um, you can make it flexible. Um, you can tailor it to how you want it to be. So my course, um, I'm able to pick my modules. This term, I picked all my modules, everything I wanted to study. And in my first term, I, I just did, I had to just pick two. So um, I think there's a lot of variation in how people do their um, subjects and things and how they want to cater it to the things that they really want to learn, which is, one of the best things about studying. Um, you can do internships where you can work for a little bit. You can do electives where you can do one module in anything that you want, depending on what your course is like. But because I do a single honours, just politics, I could do an elective in um, like psychology, film. Those are just some of the examples of things I've done and it's been really enjoyable. It's just quite nice to learn a different subject area or you can do a placement. So that's what second and third year can look like um, depending on what you study. So graduation is a time of celebration. So it's with like your friends and family. You worked hard for three years or four or five, however, however long your course is. And you just get to have a bit of fun on that day, take some pictures, wear a robe and shake Sanjay Vasquez's hand. Um, yeah, I don't know if you recognize him. He's from like Doctor Who and something else, I can't remember. But um, yeah, so that's basically graduation. You get to celebrate and it's just a great day. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, but yeah, so what is my next steps? I'm not going to lie, I'm not too sure. And that's normal. A lot of students don't know what they want to do after they graduate. But I do know I might want to continue that kind of activism, working with BAME creatives and working in like media and communications, dealing with um, issues of representation and diversity. For those of you that don't know what BAME means, it's basically an abbreviation for minorities. So it means Black, Asian and minority ethnics. Um, so that's basically the kind of work I see myself going into, um, but not really sure what exactly yet. So yeah, so I might do a master's, um, just sort of brush up on some skills or just learn something completely different. Um, but the thing is do your research, just make sure you have, you're able to make informed choices about what you wanna study. That's probably the most important thing and take your time. Don't let anybody rush you. This is your own personal journey. Um, but yeah, um, I don't think that's there's anything else from me. So if you've got any questions, please do type them in into the Menti website um, with that code. I hope that was really informative. Um, but thank you so much. That's been that's it from me. Thank you for listening. Amazing, Nina. Thank you so much. And, and really, really interesting. I particularly liked um, to hearing about your podcast. That sounds really cool. Yeah. Um, 
but I'm, we've got a few questions coming in. Okay. I'm just going to share my screen. If I can. Okay, so the first one, I don't know if anybody can see that. So the first one is, oh, screen sharing has stopped. Okay, anyway, the first one is, it basically asks, did you live at home while you're at uni? Obviously we've had that answered. Mm -hmm. But I was just wondering if you could like elaborate a bit more on why you chose to go to Sussex rather than what a university in London. Yeah, that's a good question, actually. Um, so for many of us that are Londoners, I feel like if you live in London, you've lived there for a long time, it can start to feel like a bit a bit of a bubble. And I've always felt like um, I just wanted to see something different. And Brighton was an area that I was formerly like familiar with because I've been to the mm. beach and things like that. So I was like, you know what? It might be nice to live in a different city. And um, another bit of advice I would give is when you are... Um, looking at university options look at the area like is this something is this an area you could see yourself living in would it be a city could it be more countryside a town um so i chose brighton um, particularly because it was sort of it's not exactly london but it's similar in terms of it being a city area so i just sort of want to see something different yeah i think you're with a lot of london students there um yeah. just i mean we we're, we're going to be talking about charlotte later who whose university is literally down the road from Regent High. But it's really good to see that like London students leaving London to go to university as well. Um, the next question I'm gonna mark that as answered, um, is uni harder than A-levels? Can you answer yeah. that? I can, I can say, I think that uni is not as hard as A-levels. And that the reason being it's, wow because you have more time. When you're doing your mm. A-levels, you are literally like working at a fast pace, like doing a nine to three day, you might have one or two free periods to get your notes down. It is, it is like fast and it's intense. So that's what made my A-level experience really difficult because it's like you're trying to grasp all this information within a short period of time. Mm. But when you're at university, I'm not saying the content is easier per se, but you have more time to digest the information mm -hmm. you've been given. You have more time to sort of think about things and, and sort of learn in a way that you want to. So mm -hmm. um, in that respect, I would say university is easier because you're able to make it for yourself, whereas A-levels are sort of constructed for everybody to sort of do mm -hmm. it at the same pace. So, yeah. That's a really good answer. And I, I think a lot of um, students listening to this or watching this be kind of shocked but I understand exactly what you mean because you're you're juggling so many different you know different subjects rather than focusing on that one mm -hmm. um my last question that I'm going to ask before we go on to Charlotte and we'll pick up some of these questions is and I'm just going to try and get this on the screen so can you choose to do a foundation year or do universities decide for you so that kind of speaks to what we're talking about um the transition between a levels and um uni so did you make that decision for yourself or um so for myself I the university did decide for me but I think there is a lot of value in you can do it you can voluntarily do it mm. and I really think that universities in general have do not push it enough and for me I really benefited from doing a foundation year because it sort of set me up um, with all my skills for my first year so in a way I was ahead of my peers because I knew how to um, reference which is really really important mm. when you're at university I learned how to write my essays I got used to all the facilities and everything on campus I just already knew everything um, so there is value in doing a foundation year. However, some people might not want to because mm. they might have an end goal already or they, it's an extra year. So that's an extra, you know, it's extra, it's, it, can, it can come across as quite costly, but if you feel like you will benefit from sort of exploring other um, areas of study, then I really highly recommend it, so. That's a really good bit of advice, I think. Um, and that's really also the point about referencing and just like basic academic practice that, maybe A-level students aren't, aren't used to, having that foundation year is so vital and it sets you up to do, I think, really well in your first and second years in particular. Yeah, and I right? think there's quite a few statistics that show that as well, that kids that really? did. 
yeah um unfortunately I don't have it with me if I I should have been more prepared. <laughs> but um if I'm able to manage that like, get some statistics surrounding that um there mm. was evidence that showed that kids that did or students that did foundation years um performed better because mm. um we were we're just better equipped and we you have more experience in writing essays and things like that and it mm. just doesn't feel as intense as just going into your degree so mm. definitely well, thank you so much for that, Mina. That was a really, really valuable presentation. I think now I'm going to stop sharing my screen and, and ask if Charlotte can um, come in. And, and we're going to save a few of those questions that um, we had through the mentee uh, for the end of our presentation. But for now, I'm going to introduce Charlotte, who is a senior widening ring participation officer at London Metropolitan University. And today she's going to be speaking about all things related to student finance. So over to you, Charlotte. Thank you, Taylor. And thank you, Mina. That was a really great presentation. Uh, I'm Charlotte. I work at London Metropolitan University in the outreach team. Um, and today I'm going to talk to you about money matters. So thinking about how you might actually afford to pay for your university degree. So I think for lots of people going to university, definitely myself included, one of the main things I was worried about was whether I'd actually be able to afford to go to university. So I knew that my parents weren't going to be able to help me that much. And I kind of thought for a little while that maybe university wouldn't be possible for me. But actually, it was. And it's definitely possible for you. And um, so I thought I could talk you through um, some of the main kind of bits about student finance. So hopefully you can uh, ease up on that worry a little bit. So today we're going to talk about how much university actually costs, how you pay for it. Really importantly, we're going to talk about loans and grants and other support that you get um, when you go to university. And then we're also going to chat very briefly just about how you pay it back at the end as well. So um, thinking about university, it's an investment to begin with. And if you think about all those amazing opportunities that Mina just spoke about, so her subject, studying something that she's passionate about, um, in terms of jobs that she might be able to get when she comes out of university, the skills you can gain, uh, all different things that you get at university. It's a really, really great investment. Um, but what are you actually paying for? So we know that university costs money, but what are you actually paying for? So the first thing that you're paying for is something that we call tuition. And you might have heard of tuition fees quite a lot. It pops up in the news quite regularly. So when we talk about tuition, we really mean paying for the things that make your degree what it is. So your subject area. So for example, it could be the facility so um, at London Met if you're a science student you spend a lot of time in our super lab so thinking about paying for all that specialized equipment and facilities similarly if you're an art student you're paying for the studios you're paying for the lecturers and the academics and the people that support your learning so that's kind of what we're talking about with tuition and um, just while I'm moving to the next slide have a think in your head how much you think um, tuition fees might cost because this is something you do hear about quite a bit so I'm not leaving you in suspense for too long. So currently universities can charge up to £9,250 a year. But the main thing to know is that you do not have to turn up to the university on day one with nine grand and say, I'm, I'm ready to learn. And you can borrow this money in the form of a loan. And we're going to talk about how that works. Um, and if you borrow that money in the form of a loan, it gets paid directly to the university um, and you will pay it back once you've finished studying. And again, we'll talk a bit more about that in a second. Now, when you're at university, um, just paying for your tuition fee, there are other things that you might need to pay for as well. Um, so Taylor um, and uh, Mina were talking about um, where you might live at university. Um, and uh, one of the things that you might need to pay for is accommodation. So I grew up in London as well. And similarly, I kind of, I loved the London bubble, but I wanted to kind of get away and kind of do my own thing. See if I could live by myself, see if I could figure out how the washing machine worked and that kind of stuff. And um, so I had to pay for my halls of residence, or you might need to pay to live with friends. Um, but for those of you who actually maybe think, you know, I, I don't know if I do want to move away from London, there's loads of amazing universities right on the doorstep of your um, school, including London Met, which is based in North London. Um, but still, you might need to pay for travel, transport, you might need to pay for books, for feeding yourself, for, for all of those other things that come along with university. Um, and again, you can also borrow money in the form of a loan to help you pay for these things, and that's called a maintenance loan. Now, with this one, um, this is money that comes down directly to you because obviously it's you that's going to be spending it um, but the student loans company I think they know that giving students a big wadge of money all in one go is probably not the best idea so it comes split in different installments throughout the year which does mean that you are going to have to budget maybe for the first time and um, I know definitely when I first got my first installment um, I didn't budget very well and the last few weeks of term were a lot of pot noodles um, so yeah think about how you might budget that money. 
Now, with your maintenance loan, um, the amount that you're able to borrow um, depends on a few different things, which I'm going to talk to you about in a second. And again, you'll pay this back once you've finished studying. So how do you get this money? Um, so you make one application that covers both of those different types of loans, so the tuition fee and the maintenance loan, and you apply on the student finance website. So you have to give them quite a bit of information, including the information about what we call household income. I'm not going to go too much into this today because it's kind of an overview, but your household income is how much money your parents or your guardians or whoever's looking after you at home, how much they make. Um, and that kind of impacts on how much money you can borrow. Um, once you've applied for it, it will follow you to whichever university that you go to. Um, and it's something that, again, I was really kind of panicking about filling in this form. And I just in my head, I built it up as this massive stress. So I kind of left it and left it. But what you want to do is you want to get this sorted as soon as possible so you can just kind of tick it off your list. So once you've kind of made uh, your application, the student loans company will tell you how much money you're allowed to borrow. So um, everybody can borrow the tuition fee loan, but the amount of money that you can have for maintenance, so for your living costs, depends on a few different things. So the first one, it depends on your household income, so the amount of money that your household makes. Then it depends on whether you're going to be moving away from home or living at home. And then it also depends on where you're going to live. So there's some figures up on the screen. This changes every kind of year, but this is just to give you a bit of an example. So if you're living with your parents, um, you're not going to be spending as much money on maintenance. So the maximum amount that you can borrow is up to 7,747. But you can see that that goes up if you're moving away from home and you're staying outside of London, or if you're uh, moving away from home and you're living in London. Um, for me, I went to Surrey for university um, and kind of similar to what Mina was saying, I actually chose halls of residence that were kind of, they were the cheapest um, and they, I didn't have my own bathroom, but it was amazing. It was really social, really fun, really friendly. And it meant that I could use more of my maintenance loan on other things that I wanted to do. Um, so yeah, have a, bit of, have a bit of a think. And it just shows you that the amount of money that you can borrow depends on those kind of different factors. And the student loan company will let you know how much you can borrow. So it's Monday morning. If you've been kind of snoozing a little bit, um, please just make sure you're listening to this bit. So aside from the money that you can borrow in the form of a loan, which you have to pay back, there are also some really awesome things called scholarships, bursaries and grants. That is money that you do not have to pay back when you finish studying. And um, there are loads of different types of ones that can support lots of different types of people with different experiences. And it's definitely something that you wanna look into because it's free money, guys, it's free money. Um, so uh, different scholarships and bursaries and grants come under different kinds of categories. So if you have a low uh, household income, lots of universities will give you a bursary or a grant, some additional money to support you with your studies. If you are a care experienced student, so if you've been in care or foster care, or if you're estranged from your family, so you're not currently supported by your family, or maybe you're a carer, so maybe you're actually looking after somebody at home, there's lots of bursaries that you can get to support you with those things while you're at university. And if you have a disability, I'm going to touch on this again in a second, but if you have a disability, so a health condition or a learning need, and there are lots of bursaries and grants that you can get as well. Scholarships you can get in particular areas, so music, art, sport are some common ones, and you can also get some if you're thinking about um, traveling abroad. So it's really, really important to think about which one of these might apply to you because it's free money that can really help you during your degree. So just to touch on two that I think is really important to know about. Um, one thing is the disabled stu uh, student allowance. Now, when you're at university, the word disability, which might be something that you don't really think of as covering you, actually applies to quite a big range of things. So it applies to things like um, physical impairments, hearing impairments, sight impairments, but also any sort of long term health condition a mental health difficulty or things like dyslexia and dyspraxia. Um, and there's a specialised team at every university who can support you and um, a to make sure that your um, university experience is fantastic so maybe putting in um, some things for you talking to your lecturers helping you with accommodation helping you to get extra time in exams or uh, coursework extensions but also they can help you to apply for the disabled students allowance which again is a free pot of money that can support you with things like extra technology maybe it's somebody to take notes for you maybe it's supporting you with your transport into university and um, which is amazing and again this is money that you don't pay back at the end another one that i just wanted to talk to you about 
um, is the Unite Foundation Scholarship. So this is an example of a specific scholarship for um, anybody who is a care leaver or care experienced or estranged from their family. And this is an amazing scholarship that gives you free accommodation for the entirety of your degree, 365 days a year, and this is something that lots of universities, including London Met, um, are signed up to. So this is something that you can get free accommodation for the entirety of your degree, which I think is a, a huge weight off your mind um, and something that, again, you don't have to pay back at the end. So how do you access these pots of money, these kind of scholarships and grants and things? So first of all, when you're applying to university, um, the uh, UCAS form will ask you some questions. So it might ask you whether you have a disability or whether you are a carer or you are care experienced. And those questions aren't there to trip you up. They're there to kind of get more information about you. And if that's shared with the university, then they can actually get in touch with you and say, hey, you're, you know, you're thinking about coming to London Met, you could be eligible for this grant or bursary. Um, Similarly, when you fill out your finance form and you're sharing that information about your household income, um, you can share that information with the university. So you need to tick a box to say, that's fine, you can share that information with the university. And then again, they can reach out to you and let you know what you're eligible for. You can also chat to your careers advisors at school about your own personal circumstances and they might be able to give you some support. Just generally do your own research, have a look around, look on the different universities websites and also there's a great app called the Grant Ferry app which can show you all the different kinds of things that you might be eligible to apply for. So um, if I offered to lend you 20 grand this morning, I was like, yep, yeah, you can have 20 grand. You'd probably want me to tell you when I was expecting it back, how much I was expecting back. Um, and I thought it would be good to tell you about what would be expected back from you at the end of university. So once you're um, finished university, your loan is kind of put together. So your maintenance loan, your tuition fee loan is all grouped together as one sum. And then you'll start to pay it back after you've graduated. So the April after graduation. Now, university is an investment, as I said, and the idea is that it improves your job prospects and your earning capability. So you only start to pay the loan back once you earn a certain threshold. And this number changes every year. At the moment, it's set at just over 26 and a half thousand pounds. So only once you reach that amount of salary, do you start paying back any of your loan. And what you do is you pay back 9% of what you're earning over that number, which sounds a little bit tricky, but basically you're, you're um, paying back 9% over that number um, of your loan. And we kind of, um, sometimes at the university talk about it as like a tax for earning more. And one thing to know is that after 30, years that debt is completely cancelled but what might that actually look like so I've got some examples on the screen of what it might actually look like when you're paying this money back so as you can see when you're on that kind of bracket of 26 and a half thousand you're not paying anything back because you're not earning anything over that and then gradually as your salary goes up the amount of loan that you pay back will go up so if you look at the 31000 pound mark you're paying about 39 pounds a month back which is kind of similar to like a, a phone contract or something like that and the good thing to know about the loan repayments is um, you don't have to remember each month to send the money back to the student loan company. It actually comes straight out of your paycheck or your payslip. So when you're paying it back, you'll look on your payslip. It will let you know how much money you're earning, how much tax you're paying. And it will also let you know how much money is going off to the student loans company. And what happens during that time if you lose your job, so you stop working or you dip back below that threshold of kind of twenty six and a half thousand pounds, then you'll stop paying back your loan. And as I mentioned earlier, if you haven't paid it off in full after 30 years, the remaining balance is wiped. So finally, um, if you are um, concerned about money, which, as I said, was one of the things that I was really worried about and just sort of worrying about. It was the first time I was budgeting for myself and having to stretch my student loan. There are lots of things you can do to kind of make your money go a little bit further. So the first ones to think about are a student discount card. Um, it's currently called a totem card. It's amazing. Most shops, restaurants, cinemas, experiences will give you a student discount with that card. Um, you can also get a student bank account, which usually come with um, overdrafts that are interest free or some extra perks. 
student travel, uh, you can get a student uh, Oyster card, a student rail card, which can save you lots of money. If you're moving away to go to university and you know you're gonna wanna come home and visit your family, then student rail card is awesome. And um, as Mina mentioned, she works while she's a student and most universities have loads of amazing opportunities for you to work. So you could be a student ambassador, something like that. Um, the Uni Days website is awesome, gives you loads of discounts on things. You can get student prime memberships and student Spotify, so you pay less for those services. And um, our university, our gym is free, and I know that's quite similar across other universities or societies that you join, you get to do really awesome activities for a lot kind of cheaper. And also there's lots of free software um, at university as well. So um, lots of our computers have got free tech and free software that you can use. So there's lots of different ways that you can stretch your money. So just to kind of clarify everything I've spoken about, we've talked about the money that you can borrow in a form of a loan to pay for your tuition fees and your living costs. We've spoken about those amazing scholarships and bursaries and grants that you can get. We've spoken a bit about some of the support you can get at university. So if you have a disability, if you're a care experienced student or a carer, um, and we spoke about how you will pay that back in the future as well. So um, if money was something you were really worried about, I hope this has eased your concerns a little bit. Um, and if you do have any questions, do go to menti.com, pop in that code, um, and I'll be happy to answer those as well. So that's everything from me. Thank you so much for that Charlotte it was really really useful um I'm just going to share a few questions that we've got through on the mentee um the but first I wanted to just clarify and like um elaborate on what you were saying about uh the student loan being more like a graduate tax so in my experience you know it's really important to say that each month as as you say this comes out more like a national insurance or tax payment rather than a loan that um you would normally take out and the fact that it's adjusted on the basis of what you earn makes it so much different to any other loan that you you would otherwise get so i would just make sure that people realize that this is much more like a tax than a than a loan right um yeah I don't know if exactly you so when when we think about the word loan i think we can think of some quite scary loans we think about um how you pay those back but it is a very different system and the idea that you're paying it back depending on what you're earning um, does make it and um, makes it easier to do. So the first question we have is, are foundation courses cheaper than just a regular course? Uh, so with a foundation course, um, as kind of Mina, Mina talked about earlier, it's a great way of kind of uh, moving from A-levels or BTECs into university. So you're adding an extra year onto your study, which will add an extra cost on. And um, different universities have things set up differently, where if you're doing a foundation course and you don't transfer onto the main degree, um, then it can make it cheaper for you. So it's definitely worth looking into whether a foundation course is right for you. And um, as Mina said, sometimes the university itself, when you're applying, will actually reach out and say you've wanted to apply onto this degree but actually we think uh, the foundation degree would be better for you and then have a look at what their fee system is and how that will work if you transfer from that year zero onto the first year of the course. That's a really good answer. So the, it's just important to remember that this is very much based on whatever institution you're going to, it's always yeah. going to be different. Exactly. Um, I think with all the student finance stuff we spoke about with bursaries and things, it's definitely worth having a look at the individual institution and what they're doing and what they can offer you um, and also um, talking to them. So long before you're thinking about going to university, before you've decided which one you want to go to, the university's um, services are there for you to chat to. So whether that's finding out um, what it would be like to do a foundation course or whether you would do one, what support you can get for a disability, you can chat to them well in advance, whether it's at an open day or giving them a course or dropping them an email that's a really good bit of advice um our next question is a bit of an evil one but it's very contemporary you can help um, me so on it, Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> if the first semester of or year is online will you have any kind of discount on tuition fees so this is in response to covid19 i'm sure you can answer for, for london met but are you aware of um what the broader sector is doing yeah, so this is a really interesting one and it's kind of changing uh, as, as time goes on, as universities are responding to social distancing and what the government guidelines are. But I think a lot of universities really want students to know that if they are ready to go to university and they've, they've done that prep work and they're excited about it, that they can still go. So 
London Met, for example, is currently um, saying that our uh, first year of study is likely to be online, but that once the rules change, students can then choose to join us later in the year if they feel comfortable and the government guidelines say that they can. So at the moment, our tuition fees are staying the same. And um, again, different universities are, are doing things very differently. And I think this will change as the government guidelines change and as the social distancing rules change as well. And um, so it's just, I think, and I think being a student who's thinking about going to university at the moment, it does feel like you've got this extra worry and, you know, you've heard all of those amazing things that Mina said about, you know, uh, making friends and how amazing it is being on campus. But I think if you're, if you're ready to go, um, you know, universities are doing everything that they can to make your learning and your experience exactly the same. Um, and they have been, you know, we've been teaching online for the last kind of semester. So we've, we know how it works and we know that students are still really benefiting from it. And there's also an argument that says that now is potentially the best time to go to university because, um, you know, without sounding too bleak, the, the job market does look a bit, a little yeah. bit more um, difficult. So now is a really good time to actually um, seize the moment and upskill, have that degree for when hopefully this all passes and you can enter the job market as a more qualified individual. That's the thing and sort of you know in the past you might have been thinking about maybe taking a gap year but obviously our, our travel is very limited at the moment as well um, and you know if you if you are thinking about going to university, universities are doing everything that they can to make it an amazing experience for you to reflect what a student who, who, who went last year would be doing so yeah considering you know the options for what else you might be doing are quite limited and um, it might be a good time to, to go for sure. Um, we've got another question here. It's a bit more specific uh, related to these Unite scholarships that you mentioned for care, care experience students. Are there a limited number of these or? or... Yeah, there are, a, there are a limited number, but the, um, they do cover a lot of different universities um, and, and a, a high percentage of people that apply for them will get them. Um, I'd really recommend going on the Unite Scholarship website um, and just having a look at how the application form works. Um, but a high percentage of people that apply for them and um, will get them. It's also worth mentioning on this point as well, actually, that aside from the Unite Foundation Scholarship, um, different universities also offer different packages for um, young people who are care experience so whether that's financial support so um, bursaries specifically from the university or whether it's kind of um, support in terms of helping you to get ready for university and um, mentoring tutoring and um, additional support with finding accommodation all of those different things most universities will have one specific person who is your main contact if you are a care experienced young person and you're a bit worried about going to university so definitely look on the unite scholarship website have a look on individual websites of universities to see if they have a financial package specifically for care experienced students and do get in contact with the university anyway because they can tell you about any sort of pre-enrollment events that are specifically for care experienced students or mentoring schemes and, and things like that. So again the, the advice is basically to look far and wide, shop broadly, you know you um, there's tons of amazing universities in the UK and all of them um, not only have a specific academic offer to to you as a student but also you know on a on a social basis they they can support you in more ways than just academically Definitely. um our next question uh which is quite a difficult one but i think really good is how long will it take to uh pay off my student loan um charlotte do you want to take this yeah, so that's a really good question. Again, when you're taking out money, you kind of want to know how long that will be. And, and it really does depend on your own circumstances. So it depends because it's tied to the amount of money that you earn and you're paying back a percentage of your earnings. It really depends on how much you earn, how quickly you move through those pay brackets and um, as to how much you will pay off. And as I mentioned, um, the idea is that after 30 years, um, whatever's remaining of that loan will will, will disappear. Um, and actually for, for a lot of people, um, unless you're in a very, very high um, earning bracket, you will not pay off the entirety of your loan because it will get to that 30 year period and you will have some left. Um, so for this one, it, it really depends. You can use kind of student finance calculators and things to think about the type of job that you might go into. Think about, you know, if you're thinking about starting in a grad scheme, what will your starting earnings be? But it's kind of a tricky calculation to do. And um, so it really does depend on how much you're earning and, and I suppose how much you've paid off of it once you get to that 30 year mark. It's, it's such a, it's kind of quite a scary question, isn't it? Because like you say, you, you're taking out such a uh, big loan 
but you you kind of don't know when you're going to uh, pay it off. Yeah. Again, I I just you know express to students that this is really so much different to any other loan in the way that it just goes up and down. If you earn more, you're going to pay it off quicker. If you earn less or uh, below that twenty six thousand pound threshold, you might not pay it off for a long time. But it's the student loans company um, arranges these loans in order to be fair, so that they aren't um, pinching you too hard, say, if you're a lower um, earning worker. Um, and if you're earning more, you will pay off more. Um, so it's, it's, down, it's very much down to the individual, as you say, Charlotte. Um, so another question is, so can university change fees while you're still studying? Uh, so the, the fees that you, uh, when you start your degree, the fees that you pay will be the same fees that you pay throughout um, and that, that, that won't change. So tuition fees have changed a lot in the last 20 years, but the, the fee that you go in on will be the fee that you carry through with you. So universities aren't going to turn around after the first year of study. And say, and actually, we want, yeah. we want 20 grand this year. Uh, yeah, so the fee that you start with will follow you through. Uh, our other one is is not so much related to um, not so much related to finance, but it's more based on the admissions process. It's saying, will more universities go through clearing? I'm interpreting that as meaning, will there be more spaces through through clearing, or um, how, what is the clearing process, Charlotte? Do you could you? Yeah. So when that? you're um, when you're applying for university, um, you you make your you make your application. You decide which university is your firm choice, which is your insurance. So which one do you really want to go to? Um, and the thing is, with life, not everything goes to plan. Um, so, uh, you know, A-levels and B-techs, it's such a stressful time and such small things can impact how that go. And you might just have a bad day on the day of the exam and you don't quite get the grades that you want. And um, so when you get your results through, it means that you might not have got into the universities that you applied to. Um, and then what you can do is you can go through this clearing process. So the idea is that you can then apply to universities that still have spaces remaining to go and study with them. Um, and lots of students do go through clearing and go on to excel at university, have a a great time really enjoy the university um, and one thing I always say to students when you are applying to university when it comes to results day have a list of universities that maybe the grades are a little bit lower or just universities that you'd still be happy to go to that when it comes to clearing and if you don't get the grades that you want you you've already know a bit about them you're not going to be like blindly running around looking for numbers and things that you can apply to and basically the universities will see how many places they have left, depending on how many people got onto the course or not. And they might be offered to be able to offer you a space through clearing. Um, so it's it's a great it's a great way of doing it. Also, if you apply to university and all of your offers get rejected, even before results day, you can sometimes go into clearing early and see which spaces are available. Also, it's kind of worth mentioning adjustment as well. So sometimes on results day, you had a really great day and you've actually done better than you thought. And so you might want to go to a higher tariff institution and you might be able to use adjustment to do that as well. Well, one question just on, um, this can be the last one we take um, for this little session. So it's, if I go through clearing, do I have to submit student finance again? That's a really good question. So that's a really good question. So when you initially do your student finance form, they will ask you for information on where you're going. But the idea is that your finance will follow you to whichever institution you go to. So you won't have to do the entire form again, because obviously you'll have already submitted your um, parents' income, for example, your parents' or guardians' income. You will just need to let the student loans company know where you're going so that they can, um, they can follow through with your loan to wherever you're going. So if you don't end up going to the institution that you put down on the form in the first place then you will just need to let student finance know so they can arrange for your tuition fees to go to your new uh, destination institution that's really useful so there is a bit of a process there but it, it stays the same essentially yeah that's great okay so we're just about to run out of time so i just wanted if mina's still there um so first, I'm going to ask Charlotte if you had one tip to say, you know, if somebody's worried about student finance um, impacted on going to university, what, what bit of advice would you give them? 
Oh, that's such a good question. I think it's a really big worry. It was one of my main worries to the point that I think it sort of, for me, overclouded the excitement about going to university. I think I was worried so much about whether I'd be able to afford it that I wasn't doing the exciting thing of like, oh my God, I'm, you know, I'm moving away and I'm going to study this subject that I really love. So my advice would be to don't put it off because you think it's scary. Don't put it away under the carpet. Just, just try and sort it out. As soon as you're thinking about going to university, have a read of all the advice that's online on the UCAS website, on the student finance website, and also start to have those conversations with whoever is at home to let them know that they're going to need to share some of their information as well, because I think that can come as a bit of a shock uh, to your parents that they have to share their information with the student loan company. So do it early, talk to your parents or guardians about it. Um, and if you want to go to university, just do that bit first, and then it means you can go without that worry. That's really useful. And Mina, if you have one bit of adv advice for students who might be thinking about going to move outside of London uh, to university, what would it be? Uh, well, my one bit of advice um, is if you are going to move away is just make sure you do your research. Um, I am a firm believer in like instinct, like if you instinctively know where you could like end up in terms of area. Like I, I know that I prefer a bit of city life, but I like a bit of green. I like seeing a bit of the sea and things like that. I just always knew I'd end up in a place like that. But I definitely, more than that, I did a lot of research. I visited, visit is probably the second most, well, no, actually it's next to the advice I just said. Just try and if you can visit the areas that um, you see yourself studying at, um, because that's definitely, set in stone where I see myself studying and where I do not see myself studying as well so um, I think that's good if you can to try and visit as well. Yeah d don't be afraid to push yourself outside yeah. of the boundaries of London I think that's a really good bit, bit of advice. Um, so before we go I just wanted to direct you all to a, a few of other events that we're going to be hosting uh, this week so if you enjoyed today's event please do sign up in the comments for a series of workshops that will we'll be running as a part of the London Careers Festival. So later today at 2 p.m., for example, we're hosting the University of Law, who will be talking about all of the amazing careers associated with the criminal justice system. Um, and throughout the week, we're also gonna be having workshops uh, with the Speakers Trust on how to be a better public speaker, um, how to choose the right university with Middlesex University hosting there, and also a panel discussion with current London students. Um, so what remains to be said is I really hope that you enjoyed today's uh, talk and that you can join for the rest of um, the week's events. So please do like and subscribe and um, join some of those events if, if you can. But thank you to all of you who, who was watching today and especially Mina and Charlotte. Um, so I'm just going to say goodbye from everyone here and we're going to